The Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony were the most active of the New England persecutors of Quakers, and the persecuting spirit was shared by the Plymouth Colony and the colonies along the Connecticut River. In 1660, one of the most notable victims of the religious intolerance was English Quaker Mary Dyer. He was hanged in Boston for repeatedly defying a Puritan law banning Quakers from the colony. She was one of the four executed Quakers known as the Boston Martyrs. In 1661, King Charles II explicitly forbade Massachusetts from executing anyone for professing Quakerism. In 1684, England revoked the Massachusetts Charter sent over a royal governor to enforce English laws in 1686, and in 1689 passed the Broad Toleration Act. The first two of the four Boston martyrs were executed by the Puritans on October 27, 1659, and in memory of this, October 27th is now International Religious Freedom Day to recognise the importance of freedom of religion. The last few lectures have been about the changes and challenges to the Church of England between 1625 and 1688. In this lecture, the intention is to assess the level and issue of non-conformity between 1625 and 1688. Knowledge-wise, you will consider the attempts at toleration. Skills-wise, assess how non-conformity changed between 1625 and 1688. And behaviourally, you will continue to evaluate the reason for continued non-conformity in England. Attempts at religious uniformity or control in Britain has experienced non-conformity since the Roman attempts to enforce its religion on the masses. Generally, however, Christianity was accepted and Catholicism was the established religion. However, in 1381, the Peasants' Revolt sees anti-clericalism peak with the decapitation of Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for the poll tax he was responsible for introducing. Nevertheless, the attacks were not about replacing Catholicism as the religion of England, but rather the reform of it. The reformations of England and Scotland saw a rise in churches who were separate from the established churches of England or Scotland between the 1530s and the beginning of the 17th century. Some Protestants, unhappy with the religious settlements, emigrated to countries in Europe, or more commonly the New World. Many Puritans left for Massachusetts on the Mayflower, and Quakers will follow William Penn to Pennsylvania. Certainly by 1629, Charles I and William Lord faced a vocal Puritan presence in Parliament, who resisted religious change and the growth of Armenianism in England. The traditionalist historian John Neill suggested in Parliament that the Puritans were a united force against the onset of Lordanism, stating that Parliament was a Puritan choir, a group singing from the same hymn sheet. Whig and revisionist historians disagree as to how far they were united. They were certainly vocal, however, not all parliamentarians were Puritans, as can be seen in the split over the support of Charles in later years and therefore revisionists discount the idea of a Puritan choir in Parliament. London was supposed to be a hotbed of religious radicalism and non-conformity. However, by the eve of the Civil War, only 1,000 of the population of London, or 350,000, were members of separatist churches in London. That is, 0.003% of the population of London. What the Civil War enabled for nonconformists was a breakdown of censorship. With no enforced censorship, the preaching part of many radical religious groups could happen with little fear of repercussions. Also increased due to a lack of censorship was the printing and publication of material which would not have been allowed before the war. With this growth in preaching and printing ideas began to spread in England. However, it is important to remember that the spread of ideas does not always equate to growth or support for these ideas. Nevertheless, the new model army and the radical element within it stimulated debate as to how to create a godly society and increase individual liberty. These are themes which we will cover in future lectures for topic 3. Such nonconformists were, firstly, the levellers, who supported religious toleration and forced suffrage of men, the diggers, who worked the land in support of religious toleration like the levellers, but a level of equality for men and women. Or the Muggletonians, who saw themselves as the last two prophets in the Book of Revelations. 
However, when discussion of what the established church was between 1646 and 1660, Presbyterianism was the Church of England, so that Anglicanism was now non-conformity. During the interregnum was the radical dangerous sects which were feared. The most radical were known as ranters, who believed in the extreme of predestination, and if your life was completely predestined, then choices are pointless. Bizarrely, it was the Presbyterians who assisted Charles II during the Restoration, seen by General Monk arranging the return of the King. Charles II understood this, and this explains why toleration was offered in the Declaration of Breda in 1660. However, no matter how much Charles II wanted toleration, the actions of Veneer in 1660 brought the fear of radical groups to the forefront again. Fears of radicals endangering an individual's ability to get into heaven and the security offered by the restoration of the Stuart monarchy, so a harsh clampdown on non-conformists. The Act of Uniformity is the keystone to the Clarendon Codes of 1661 to 1665. The Clarendon Codes was a central point of a strategy to create uniformity within the Church of England. By 1669, it was clear it had failed to achieve any of this. The general feeling of the country was changing, and many of the people who wanted to prevent had softened or died from old age. Many of the ejected ministers were also becoming used to a life outside of an established church, and began setting up academies to train new ministers. By 1678, these newly ordained pastors began to take their places among the non-conformity ministries and by 1689, 100 new recruits had joined the ranks of the ejected clergy. Sheldon wanted to control the growing non-conformist groups, and a second conventicle act was passed in 1670. However, records indicate a limited impact on the groups, and this could be evidence of a growing level of support for non-conformists, who many knew to be otherwise peaceable, respectable neighbours. This is a reflection of the changing ideas many in the 17th century. Charles continued to challenge the authority of Parliament over religious uniformity via his attempt to suspend the Act of Uniformity in 1662 and his Declaration of Indulgence in 1672. However, by 1673, Charles was forced to withdraw the indulgence. What we can see is that Charles and his cabal had just the level of support badly. Many separatists had received licences to preach in 1672, which were not recorded until 1675. But the Second Dutch War was a failure, and the run of the Exchequer in 1672 created a financial mess for Charles II. Within the year of indulgences, many non-conformist groups had consolidated their positions, strengthened by the licences issued by the King. Surprisingly, as a result of the Popish Plot and the Rye House Plot, Charles II retaliated against the Whigs and their supporters in the dissenting groups. This drove many dissenters underground, avoiding the eye of the King due to the harshest ever persecution the dissenter groups ever experienced. Unsurprisingly, the persecution found, and in 1686 a re-emergence of non-conformity against the Catholic promotion by James II happened. The survival of dissenters can be attributed to three main reasons. Firstly, commitment to their beliefs and their need to retain them. Secondly, support and sympathy, firstly as individuals, then via social and political organisations. And finally, errors of their enemies. The mistake to define uniformity so narrowly at the beginning meant an increasing number of those who became dissenters. If they attempted salami tactics, this could have been far more successful. It is important to remember that in answering any question on why non-conformity or dissenter activity survived, you explore these three reasons. In this lecture, the intention was to assess the level and issue of non-conformity between 1625 and 1688. Knowledge-wise, we have explained the attempts at toleration. Skills-wise, having explored the attempt at toleration, you must assess how non-conformity changed between 1625 and 1688. Behaviourally, 
you will continue to evaluate the reason for continued non-conformity in England and reach a judgment as to why it survived between 1625 and 1688. Now complete the associated material.